Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this special interview. Today we have returning guest to the show, Dave Kranzler of Investment Research Dynamics, located at investmentresearchdynamics.com. And I got to tell you, anytime that Dave fires off a tweet, I read it. And every time that Dave publishes something on investment, I read it. And that's because Dave really has a grasp of what's going on here. And not only that, but he's in these markets and he's extracting profits from them. And if you're trying to do the same thing, but you're not getting Dave's insight, you need to get over to investmentresearchdynamics.com, check out the Mining Stock Journal, check out the Short Sellers Journal, because if you're not doing those two things, you're leaving money on the table. Dave, I'd like to thank you for joining us again on Silver Doctors. Wow, Paul, thanks for that intro. I appreciate it. Thanks for having totally, me back on. You totally get it. And one of the tweets that you fired off today um, totally caught my attention. So I just want to start there, Dave, because it was interesting. I, I don't know where exactly you got that tweet from, but it was about an article about this massive, massive, massive surge in business startups. And I looked at this hockey stick graph on there, and my thought was, Okay, where are all these businesses? Because when I'm out and about, I see businesses that are shut. I see stores that are half full. I see stores that are closing down. So my initial thought was, are th is this just a surge in paper businesses getting ready to flood this next round of PPP to do all these loans and get all these forgivable loans? Or, or what were your thoughts on that? And, and can you explain a little bit about what that article was about, Dave? Well, there's been, I mean, it's, it, it came from uh, Bespoke which is a website and they also have a subscription side to their website. And um, it's, it's, I, I sometimes find it useful for some of the data that they dig up. Um, and they, they're not the first ones that have reported this, but apparently there's been uh, quite a surge in, in new business applications during the third quarter. So, um, and you know the chart that they, the chart they're showing is is, oh okay, so it goes back to uh, September two thousand four. Uh, and if you read through the article, though, I mean a a, a fair portion of it are um, businesses that are unlikely to result in hiring. So that means, you know, people who probably lost their jobs during the lockdown or whatever and have decided to go out on their own, do their own, you know, whether it's consulting, whatever. So that's probably a big part of it, uh, because if, if you're not hiring anyone, that means you're a sole proprietor. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you're running a retail store if you're a sole proprietor or a restaurant. Mm -hmm. So. Um, but w what was interesting is, and I, you know, I read through this to make sure that they hadn't mentioned it, is they're not, you got to net that number out of closures. So for instance, I don't know, about two, maybe two months ago, six weeks ago, Yelp published a study. And, you know, that, that's a pretty good resource in terms of small businesses, if you ask me. And they, they did a survey and, and they said that their survey showed that 60% of the businesses that were shut down during the pandemic were never going to reopen. So, I mean, yeah, that's all well and good is, you know, it's, 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 it's like the employment report. They show the number of, of new jobs. Well, given the limitations of the census bureau and the data manipulation that goes on, but um, you know, no, nowhere in the report do you ever find out, you know, well, how many jobs were lost during the same, <laughs> during the same month that you're reporting all these new jobs? You know what I mean? And, and it so sounds it's, like it can to also me, it's be... kind of a deceptive, it's a deceptive article because that's what you really need to know. That's great that a lot, there's a lot of new businesses. Most of them, obviously sole proprietorships, according to the article, it says, uh, you know, uh, the numbers are much smaller in absolute terms if you strip out the the b businesses that are not going to don't intend to hire anyone. Mm -hmm. So you know, but again, you know, for the net effect on the economy and and the net reflection on how the how well the economy is doing, you need to you need to net out the number of businesses that that have closed during this during the month or during mm -hmm. the quarter. It's almost like it's a, a kind of like what we have going on between the markets and then Main Street. It's like on paper, you got one thing and it's looking good. But when you look at the reality on the street, it's kind of like not really making sense there, if I'm understanding that right. I, I agree with that. And I, you know, I've noticed this probably since June. A lot of the articles that uh, it seems like a lot of the mainstream business reporting 
when they're talking about economic data and economic activity, that it, it's almost like it's it's hyperbolized. It's mm -hmm. almost like it's propagandized intentionally to try. And they, you know, maybe th there's a directive to try and um, stimulate hope and optimism. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. That's that's a great point there. Now, Dave, turn into silver here. I don't know if you saw this um, that the Silver Institute, but there's there's something interesting that the Silver Institute put out today. And here's what they're saying. They're saying that over the first nine months of 2020, year over year inflows into silver ETFs increased nearly three times. Some 300 million ounces were added to silver ETFs in the first nine months. And they're also saying that 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 coin demand, they call it bullion coin demand. So they're not really separating rounds, bars and coins, but they're saying bullion coin demand is also up 65 percent over the first nine months of the year. And I'm thinking, OK, we've had, you know, the mine closures, we've had the refiner closures, we've had the mint closures, we've had the logistics problems, we've had all of these things going on, yet all of the silver is just magically flowing into these ETFs without a hiccup. So I guess just in general terms, what are your thoughts of the silver market right now? Um, there's also talk about the CFTC is going to start getting tough on position limits. Ooh, and so we're going to see some justice. I don't really have a lot of faith in that because I think they're going to have some exemptions, especially when it comes to something like, you know, silver and JP Morgan and their position sizes. So just in general, what are your thoughts on the silver market and and what are you looking at with the dynamics there right now, Dave? I mean, I, you know, I, I probably the wrong guy to ask. I mean, I, I think silver is ridiculously cheap relative to the price of gold and and relative as a relative to being a monetary metal. I think it's I think it's um, ridiculously cheap. I mean, if, if you get, you know, if if. A miracle happens and the global economy does stage this V recovery, which I'm not seeing in any of the data that I've seen. I'm seeing a bounce. I'm seeing a dead cat bounce, but I haven't seen any sustainability or evidence of sustainability. Um, you know, if that happens, all of a sudden you're going to have a, a, a much, you know, a bigger demand, industrial demand for silver. And, I, you know, I don't I don't even really track the, the uh, demand numbers for silver because, it, you know, that. The numbers get obfuscated intentionally, and you know, referring back to you know the supposed amount of silver flowing into ETFs, that's 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 opaque also because there isn't anyone I know, including myself, who thinks that there's actual that amount of actual physical bars going into those ETFs. I mean, there's not, you know, there's there's not a. Um, there's not any guardrails or accountability there. And these, you know, something like maybe, you know, why don't these ETFs let you redeem your shares for silver bars? So, I, I mean, I know the Sprott one does, but yeah, you have to have, you know, probably six figures worth of, of PSLV shares in order to turn them in for bars. You know, I know, I know for, I know they have 400 ounce gold bars in there. In their in their gold ETF, and that you know that that's a big nut for most people to swallow. Um, so I, you know, I, I'm sure there's some silver flowing into these ETFs, but I don't I don't think there's anywhere near the amount that they say there is. And I'm yeah. not the only one who thinks that. Yeah, and I would tend to think that you know if it's something like the Sprout one, like the PSLV, then I would have faith in something like that. But when it's something that's you know if we're talking about like the SLV or one of these other ones, you know, I, I would definitely question exactly how all of that silver is getting in there um, within the first nine months. Um, and and well, you know, it could be as simple as they're just you know, J.P. Morgan is the custodian for SLV. It could be as simple as. You know, they have a huge vault and they're taking if they need to, if someone questions them on it and demands to go see the, you know, the actual inventory, which, you know, if you read through the prospectus, that's extraordinarily difficult to ha make happen. I mean, you and I can't go do that. But, um, you know, I suppose they they're taking bars, unallocated silver bars that belong to other people and they can just move them over to the SLV side of the vault. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And, and, you know, and, and it's frustrating because on the one hand, like, 
you know, I talked to Rob Kirby a couple weeks ago. He said, you know, the manipulation, it's continuing. It's going on. Craig Hemke just wrote an article that was rather interesting talking about, you know, the same old shenanigans are going on. Then Ted Butler comes out and he's like, no, this is more than a slap on the wrist. This is something that's big. They're really starting to clean up now. So just just what are your thoughts on this? Are, are we really making progress here that the manipulation is coming to an end, Dave? No. And, uh, you know, I was just thinking about this this morning for some reason, but uh, remember, I don't know, a couple of years ago when they restructured the the London price fixing uh, operation and the LBMA came out and they said they're they're trying to make changes so that what happens on the LBMA and with the price fixing is more transparent. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. as it turns out, it's even less transparent, you know, as an example before this restructuring they used to release the the data from the the am and the pm fix like usually within an hour after the fix was completed you know and you could go to the kitco website and and see you know what the fix price was and you could go to the lbma website and 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 see what was involved in order to fix the you know in order for the price to be fixed you know you could look at how many iterations it took to balance out the supply and demand for gold and silver well now they don't release the data until about 12 hours later and it's intentional uh, you know it's 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 everything these people do is to intentionally obscure any kind of vis visibility in the precious metals market and it's been like that forever and it, it, there's no reason why it won't continue to be like that is the cftc you know does that big fine JP Morgan has to pay is that going to stop them from from you know manipulating the the silver market well no first of all spoofing wasn't the problem you know it was it, it's it's the massive unloading of paper silver at opportune times in order to push the price down you know whether it's on the COMEX or the LBMA or in the Globex overnight trading system you know what I mean Mm -hmm. It's almost like spoofing is the fall guy and these six traders exactly. that were charged. Exactly. And that's, they, you know, that's not the first time that, that uh, low-level traders have been prosecuted for spoofing the market. And the spoofing's not, yeah, you can, you can employ spoofing to help you manipulate the market, but that's not the main catalyst. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't even address the hypothecation of silver bars, the, lease, the, the central bank leasing of gold bars. Uh, the OTC derivatives, there's no visibility with those. We have no idea. All you can do, every quarter the OCC puts out a report, their, their over-the-counter derivatives report, and there's a section that tracks the precious metals. And all you can do is see the netted amount of derivatives outstanding. And you know nothing about them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Um, turning here to the stock market for a minute, Dave. You know, on Monday, on Monday, President Trump tweeted out, six times something about the stock market. He tweeted out six times something about the stock market between 8.05 in the morning and 11.54 in the morning. It tweets on Monday. So, you know, everybody's so sure that the market's just going to go up and all that they're waiting on is, is, is this next round of fiscal stimulus so the Robin, trader, Robin Hood traders can get their trade on. But I mean, I don't know. How does a person even trade these markets right now? I mean, you're looking at this massive double top in the S&P and in the NASDAQ, and I'm thinking, I mean, or in the Dow, you know, is it going to be Dow 35,000 or Dow 25,000? At this point, I have no clue. How do you even make sense of the stock market and the financial markets in general right now? It's tough. And again, it's, it's you know, they've borrowed the, the methodologies that are being employed in the precious metals market. They're, you know, they're 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 intentionally making it difficult for shorts to try and uh, effect price discovery on the market, and the, you know they they make it tough for you know pure speculators. A lot of these pure speculators they'll ride they'll ride their call options up, and then boom you'll get a big downdraft in the stock market like we had you know what last week I guess, um, and it wipes out their profits so. Um, it, it's it, the problem is is that all of the Federal Reserve intervention in the markets and the official intervention, you know, that that's kind of going on globally. Um, it, it's basically created completely dysfunctional markets. I mean, 
it's it's i mean as you know you know most stocks are just insanely overvalued especially these tech stocks that you know don't make money have never made money and never will make money and yet they're sporting market caps in the tens of billions so um i mean best strategy is just put together a good portfolio but make sure you also have some physical. I would, I would probably make that a, a meaningful percentage of my investment allocation that you just get, and that you safe keep yourself, and you just sit on it. And in the mining stocks, you just buy and hold them, because uh, you know otherwise. I mean, I, it is the market is you can scalp it, but you gotta you gotta be quick. It's like you know if you put on a you put on a a, a short position or a put position. And you wake up like this morning and the market's down. I mean, the Dow opened down well over 200 points. Um, and then, you know, within the last hour, the Dow had gone green. Now it closed red again. But, um, you know, normally you would expect to be able to hold that short position and ride it out for several days, you know, because a downtrend would start maybe. But now it's like, it's like you said, you know, the market starts to to head south quickly and Trump all of a sudden Trump tweets. I mean, there is a former White House advisor who admitted whenever we needed the stock market to go up at a certain point, we would roll Larry Kudlow out on CNBC mm-hmm. <laughs> or yeah. Fox. So, yeah. you know, so I mean, these, even these guys are admitting they're manipulating the markets. Yeah. And, and I actually picked something out the other day. Um, with regards to the Trump tweets, because that Tuesday when he said the stimu- I'm calling off the stimulus talks, that Tuesday tweet, the markets immediately plunged. It was like 11.46 in the morning or 11.48. And then the, the, that same evening when the flip-flop occurred and it was like go big or go home or something like that, that first tweet that caused the markets to tank had the word stimulus in it. The second tweet saying, no, it's back on, let's go even bigger than before, that did not have the word stimulus in it and we didn't get that kind of reaction out of the markets instantaneously. Um so and and then you look at something like silver talking about maintaining positions or trying to trade these markets. You know, you're sitting at 2475, you know, not even 24 hours ago, it gets walked down to the low 23s to where do we bottom at this morning? You know, you get walked down into the 2365 and now we're back up to 20 2445 or something like that. So it's just it's just a roller coaster of volatility right now in addition trying to hold on to positions. Well, I mean, I'll tell you, it's it's uh, like that, you know, that hit that happened on Tuesday. I mean, that was a blatant manipulative hit. And I'm kicking myself for for not <laughs> getting onto the SD Bullion website and, or, and ordering more Silver Eagles. But, you know, it's ever since they they, you know, Silver pulled back from pressing 30 bucks back down into the low 20s, I started buying Silver again for the first time in a long time. And I bought a lot of those 2015 silver pandas that that SD Bullion had on special, and I and I bought a bunch of silver eagles. So, um, you know, that's I don't think you really should be looking at gold and silver as a trading vehicle. I think you should be looking at it as a a way to convert fiat currency that is eventually going to be worthless into real money. And so the the you know the way I like to do it is is when the market gets hit or or taken lower, and I and I have the view that it's going to continue to go higher over time. You know, I'll buy more precious metals. And before we let you go here today, Dave, you know, the one of the things about that uh, Silver Institute article this morning was talking about, you know, a lot of a lot of increase in the investor demand from the United States, and they specifically named out Germany. So they're saying U.S. and German demand. So I guess just to Final question here for this interview today, Dave, just about gold, because, you know, I know you follow the Eastern gold market. So if for the first nine months it's been U.S. and European investor demand driving like the gold and silver markets and these massive inflows into them, um, are, are, what what is the outlook on the Eastern hemisphere and as far as the gold market is concerned? Sure. Well, first, you know, just to address silver, one thing that that. Uh, the Silver Institute doesn't pick up because the information is not available. Is how much silver China's importing? They import a lot of silver because they've they've got a, a big solar program. You know, that's it's it's a it's a government mandate, 
And I mean, I, I haven't like, in, you know, investigated it, you know, to try and find updates on what's going on with that. But I know, you know, five years ago, they were consuming all of the silver that was produced internally. And um, there was a way that you could track silver concentrate going into into China. But um, so, you know, the, but in general, the, the, the amount of silver that China might be importing doesn't get reported. And, and India, India is buying a lot of silver. They, they have been buying a lot of silver. They have the same type of solar program going on. And that takes a lot of silver if you're going to solarize, you know, two countries with with a total of over two million people. So um, in terms of gold, I mean, India is buying gold hand over fist right now. The, the data that I that I have, um, that's, you know, it's a um, subscription service I subscribe to and uh, it, it, it reports um, data from India on a, on a daily basis. And based on what's what's been reported over the last two or three weeks, India is importing a lot of silver. I mean, a lot of gold, um, and that's that's the refined kilo bars. That you know, it, they're also um, over the last few years, they've, there's been refineries that have been built in India, and they're and they're importing Dore bars. And the import tariff on Dore bars is is lower than it is on refined kilo bars. So. Um, and you know, for instance, earlier this week when the market got taken down, all of a sudden the the, the X duty premiums for that was you know that measure the price of gold that's being paid in India that makes imports viable, over and above you know the cost of an ounce of gold, including the duty, um, th those those premiums soared, and they were very high last night also, and I'm I'm sure that's why gold rallied today is because there was uh, you know large demand from India and India requires gold to be you got to deliver that gold when they when they buy it they, they, if they're buying it from you know a source that ultimately JP Morgan is supplying JP Morgan has to come up with the bars mm -hmm. so um, you know and, and I I mean that's that's basically what's been supporting the gold market for quite some time is the eastern physical demand and that makes it harder for the western banks and central banks to manipulate the price Especially if the Western demand is coming. So now it's just this massive global demand altogether. Right. Um, so, Dave, uh, what do you want people to get out of investmentresearchdynamics.com? I mean, you know, I, I haven't been posting as many blog posts as I have recently because I've, I've been busy with a lot of various things, including writing my newsletters. But um, if you go to the website, you can see some of the topics I like to write about. And then there's links there where you can find out more information about my mining stock journal and my short sellers journal. And if you're not subscribed to those, you're definitely leaving money on the table because those subscriptions <laughs> pay for themselves and profits. Dave, I'd like to thank I you for joining us again Paul. on Silver Doctors. <laughs> Thanks, Paul.